All right, so everyone, welcome to our November Family Day. So my name's Eddie. And I'm Nadia. Yeah, and I'm welcome. Today we are going to be talking a little bit about arts programs at Hull House and how that relates to, to democracy. And we're also going to talk a little bit about how important that is today. So obviously it's November 1st, just a mere two days before the national, um, national elections. And we think this is a really important thing to talk about. Not if you want to expand a little bit more about um, democracy and why that's important to us and also all of our viewers. Oh, for sure. Um, so obviously when it comes to any kind of legislative decisions that are being made in the country, we need to have representatives for that. Um, and we choose those representatives based on our elections, right? Um, so as I'm pretty sure most of us know, November 3rd is election day um, for many, many different tiers of government. That's including obviously the federal government, so the president, um, but also congressional levels, uh, state and local levels um, of elections as well, and even judges um, in our state and in our communities. Um, so we wanna just remind everybody to make sure that we're getting out there and getting our votes in. Um, that is how we make our voices heard, um, especially in a society like the United States. Um, and so you wanna just make sure that you have a plan uh, for voting. That would be uh, just making sure you have a way to, if you're voting the day of, getting to the polls or getting your ballots dropped off if you have mail-in ballots. Um, and we just wanna throw that out there to remind everybody about it. Um, also, we're gonna drop a link in the chat if anybody needs it, um, that'll give you some resources for checking your registration um, and giving you some uh, resources to set up that voting day plan. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so um, we're also going to mention a little, um, not just this event, but also events for our future. So on Thursday, November 12th, we are going to be having our next lecture, Teaching Social Justice about Museums, Culture, and Justice to Explore in Your Classroom. That's going to be um, about Therese Quinn's new book. It's going to be really focusing in on social justice museums and how those intersect and how that could be used in your classrooms. That'll be held at 6 to 8 p.m. and they'll also be online. You can RSVP um, through a link on our, our website, our Facebook, pretty much all of our social media. And then after, on Tuesday, November 17th, um, from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., there will be another event called Race and Right, Wells, Willard, and Adams. So that's going to be looking at um, three major Chicago um, activists who are really interested in not only reform work, but also things like suffrage and then on um, racial issues and many other things like that. So I think that's going to be a really interesting talk to listen in on. Again, and you can RSVP on our website, all of the Jane Addams um, Whole House Museum social media pages. And I think that will be a really interesting thing to um, take a look at. So yeah, those will all be, you know, after work. So feel free to step on in whenever you're um, feel ready. And yeah, those will be again on November 12th. That's our first one. And then five days later, November 17th, that'll be our next event. Again, RSVP links and also more information on our websites. All right. So to begin our event, I'm actually going to do a little share screen. All righty. So as we mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit about our programs and how that relates to democracy at the whole house. So what's going to happen here? So what was going on at the whole house in terms of arts? So um, there's a lot of things that were happening. So there's things like the Butler Art Gallery. There are things like the whole house kilns. Kilns, if you don't know, are where, where pottery and different ceramics would happen. There's also the Whole House Music School, Whole House Players, the um, acting troupe they had at the Whole House. And also they actually had a little formal but not formal Whole House Art School. It was a very influential for a lot of different styles of art in the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a little bit of fun fact. So a lot of people, you know, think about asking like, what was being built around the Whole House and like what building was built first and things like that. Little do people know that one of the first buildings after the original whole house was actually the Butler Art Gallery. So Nadia, why um, are people so confused about like, why they would choose the art gallery to be the first 
um, building other than other services that could have been built. So that goes back to what a settlement house is um, at its foundation. And the purpose of settlement houses was originally not to provide the kinds of social services that Jane Adams and the rest of the reformers at Hull House did, um, but rather to help find ways to bring um, like uh, the arts, literature, philosophy, um, these things that are considered cultured um, to uh, communities that are in need. Um, and so when Hull House opened, that was the intention. And so they felt, especially Ellen Gates Starr, who was Jane Addams's co-founder, um, that being able to make the arts and especially the visual arts accessible to people would help create a greater sense of unity. A lot of the people in the Hull House neighborhood um, were from many different countries. Uh, they, many of them did not speak English um, or did not speak and interact with other communities in the area. And so she felt that that would create a way to bridge those community gaps um, and help uh, people to connect on larger levels. Yeah, I think that's really democratic, a little bit of a theme of our presentation at the moment. So yeah, as Nadia said, um, essentially art was a way of you know communicating between all these cultural barriers, language barriers, all these different things, because like kind of like the underlying idea is that like you may not speak the same language you may not have the same background but everyone can make art essentially everyone can um, paint make ceramics sing act anything like that and by doing that as a community you build that community in a sense so that was kind of like the main thesis of why whole house was so arts focused in a sense um yeah so it wasn't just in like one space Art was just a facet of everyday life here at the whole house. So that's why it was so really impactful and why we like to talk about it even to this day. So, so before we actually move on, I think this is a good time to actually do a little bit of democracy of our own. So we, um, I'm not sure if anyone's in the chat at the moment. So um, I'm not sure if anyone's there watching there on the Facebook, but um, if you'd like, we actually have um, a few options for you guys. So we are actually going to be polling to talk about what we're going to be talking about next in terms of where this um, lecture presentation is going to go. So if we actually pull up the poll, we're going to have two options for our first round. First up is going to be we can either talk about whole house kilns and the pottery and things um, that were made there and why the whole house kilns are so important and also really influential. Or we can talk a little bit about bookbinding, which was a really big passion for one of the co-founders of the whole house, Ellen Gate Star. So um, these two options, if you've seen, um, it's right on the polls. So if anyone there is, you know, feel free to type in the chat or use the um, poll function if you're listening in on Zoom. Feel free and we're going to give you guys about a minute or two to kind of make your thoughts, make your decisions. And then from um, the decision, we'll move on based on popular vote. Nadia, is there anything that you would like to particularly talk about? Uh, I personally find the kilns fascinating, um, especially because there was so much happening uh, in the community around the formation of that program. Um, mm -hmm. So. Yeah. All right. How about you? I actually would like to talk a little bit about bookbinding myself. But actually, I think from what it looks like, uh, I think Ooh, I think Hull House Kilns actually won. So yeah, Nadia, I think you are a good winner. <laughs> Alrighty, folks. So let me just pause that. And we'll move on. All right. So Nadia, would you like to share a little bit about um the Hull House Kilns and why pottery was such an important part of living at the Hull House? Absolutely. Um, so as time went on, the uh, the background of the community. 
um, around Hull House changed. Um, as time went on, many of the immigrant groups that lived there originally um, were uh, of certain from certain countries, mostly from European countries. Um, as time went on, they shifted to other parts of the city and you had um, large migrations of people coming in from other spaces and a huge Mexican American community began to build around Hull House. Um, so one of the uh, major forms of art that were uh, that was very important culturally to the Mexican people is pottery. Um, and so many of these immigrants were coming from uh, different parts of the country, but most of them were coming from Mexico as a result of the Mexican Civil War. Um, and they were coming to many urban areas in the United States in hopes of getting jobs. Um, that they had actually been offered in many cases due to strikes that were happening in the city um, and people uh, being basically fired due to their participation in these strikes. Um, and so there were these openings in these, uh, these factories and these businesses. And so um, that gave an in for a lot of immigrants to be able to come to the country. Um, so here they are, they're living in this area um, and they are as many of the immigrants in the city were at the time uh, slowly um, having less access to their own sense of community because everybody's working sometimes 12 to 14 hours a day. They are um, exhausted. Their children are also emotionally and culturally being separated um, due to trying to assimilate into the, the American society. Um, there are barriers due to language. And so Hull House uh, actually sought to create a program to help fill that gap in that community as well. Um, and so Myrtle Merritt French uh, was one of the founders of the Hull House Kilns program. So um, this all allowed for many of the people in the community to be able to come have access to the resources and tools they would need uh, to be in creating pottery. Um, and because it was such a culturally important art to them, it gave them a sense of uh, home, you know, and a sense of familiarity. Um, it also gave them a, an out when it came to the very dangerous, difficult work that was being done um, in factories um, and being done in sweatshops. It was an alternative that allowed them to uh, make money off of their art because they were able to actually craft and then sell many of the pieces that they made um, and they were able to get a profit from it. So part of the 60% uh, of what they made off of the their art pieces went to them. The other 40% was given back to the kilns for resources and more tools and materials. Um, we actually have uh, one of the most well-known potters uh, from that group was Jesus Torres, who was an undocumented Mexican immigrant um, who came from uh, a particular city where uh, it is so well known or so well um, versed in the pottery arts that they literally had just pottery based art pieces lining the highway into the city itself. Um, Eddie, do you happen to remember what city that was? Uh, Silao. Thank Silao, you. Um, in Guanajuato. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, and so Jesus was actually able to make a career out of creating this artwork. Um, and so it gave just this really, really important and priceless uh, access for this community to be able to hold on to their culture and to be able to have options for their life, you know, in hopes of living a better life. Um, Jesus Torres actually started coming to Hull House for English classes. That was one of the many programs that were offered um, by Hull House and then found out about the kilns and so had that opportunity as well. Yeah, so yeah, um, little do people know that Hull House pottery was actually very popular and actually today is actually has a pretty good collector's market. So I'm actually gonna go back a little bit. So if you look on the bottom shelf there, you can see some colorful pieces like this. So I'm not sure if anyone, you know, collects pottery at the moment, but there's a style of pottery called fiesta wear. So that's actually a really interesting look at how think time changes and also a little bit about cultural appropriation. So Fiesta wear is a style of pottery, kind of um, happens around the mid, early, mid 1900s. And it's a style that's actually, um, some people say is actually inspired by whole house pottery. Some people may claim that they copied 
Hull House pottery. So this was a very um, mass produced style of pottery in the style that was really popular at the time. So at the time, especially during the Great Depression and a little bit after, a lot of people aren't gonna have a lot of disposable income in a sense. So unfortunately during that time, um, Hull House pottery in the kilns, it's really like handmade artisanal kind of style was a little bit too expensive for a lot of the buyers, especially when money was so tight during that time. So Fiestaware began to overtake in terms of sales. And you were talking about Nadia, um, the really big um, pushes and waves of Mexican migration during that time. Um, as you know, you can see today, there's actually a, um, back then another big backlash against mass immigration into the United States, particularly with Mexican Americans in the context of, of this time. Um, unfortunately, things we still hear today, like immigrants stealing jobs, spreading disease, this was happening nearly 100 years ago. So during that time, there was um, a really big push against for the deportation of a lot of immigrants, especially Mexican immigrants during that time. Hull House was actually really new during that time in that fact that they had legal services provided for these immigrants through what is called the Immigrant Protective League. So the Immigrant Protective League um, really tried their best to protect as many immigrants from deportation. But unfortunately, with the scale that deportations were happening during that time, they couldn't reach um, that many of them during the time. And also, a lot of times, immigrants were actually beginning to become scared to come to the whole house because Hull House had a reputation of being an immigrant kind of meeting place. Uh, essentially, they thought they were too scared to come because they thought, what if I get caught there? This is where immigrants go. So that's actually why a big reason why Hull House kilns didn't really last that long in the full, long, really scale of the history of the Hull House. After just a couple of years, they did unfortunately shut down, including with a store that they built on Michigan Avenue. But I think this is really um, kind of a compelling idea of really how like having these community spaces are so critical for these communities, especially um, in fact, in terms of like being able to like use their labor in the way they want in a sense. I think that's a really interesting case that we really don't really hear about things like co-ops, things like that. Those are like still very rare in the sense of contemporary America today where like workers have such like investment into like the businesses that they work in. And I think that's a really interesting question in terms of where we go on for the future and where like what questions this brings up in terms of worker labor relations. Absolutely right, especially because it was such an informal space. Um, and so it really allowed for more flexibility for what kinds of pro programs were being offered um, and for uh, who could attend those programs. Um, so, and we're gonna be talking more about community spaces um, and institutions that provide them later on in the program as well. Now that, um, Great. Stefan, did anyone- So um, does anybody have it? Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Stefan, has any um, question from the Facebook popped up about the kilns? Not that I've seen. Um, but, yep. Does anybody in our Zoom chat have any questions, um, any thoughts they'd like to share? All right, if you think of anything later, later, feel free to throw it in the chat and we'll be happy to answer them at that point as well. All right, Ooh. so next slide. Ooh. All right, if anyone wants to hear about book binding, you can actually check up on our website, look up for participatory arts. We talk a little bit about book binding, elegant stars relationship, and really her kind of obsession with it. Ooh. All righty. So we're actually going to be starting up our next little vote. So next up, you can actually choose between another, another two topics. This time, we're going to be looking at one. We can be looking at theater or the whole house players here at the whole house, kind of the birth of improv improvisational theater here at the whole house. And then also we can talk about paintings and portraits of women at the whole house as well, kind of looking at really the history of painting and why that's so important here at the whole house.
We're just giving a moment for that voting to finish up. Mm -hmm. And if we can have a few moments for the Facebook, um, since it's a little laggy, not yeah, laggy, for sure. mm -hmm. it's not uh, on time, you know? For sure. Yeah, that's, still, that's all good. We'll give it about a minute or two. Okay, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we have another one from Facebook that says painting. Okay. Ooh, that's a tie. Yeah, because we got three. Ooh. Sure is. <laughs> All right, so we got three from the um, Zoom and then two plus two from um, Zoom on paintings and one from Facebook. So, hmm, we have a tie. <laughs> Do we have a runoff election, Nadia? Suppose. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, actually, do you happen to have a coin with you, Nadia? Oh, I can grab one. Ooh, should we do a coin flip? We can do that. All righty. Give me one so, yeah, moment. If, it, if it's heads, we can do painting. If it's tails, we can do theater. Someone else voted for theater in the Facebook. Oh, okay. We're doing theater. <laughs> Never. And then another one voted paintings. So we're back. Oh, we're, we're, back. Going to the, we're going to the coin flip. It's very 50 50. All right, go for it. We love a stats major. All righty, everybody, I'm back. Here we go. So what do we want to do? Heads is which, tails is which? So let's do heads, painting, tails, theater. All right, here we go. And it's going to be heads. So I'll show you guys. Looks like we're going with painting today. Thank you, Joanne. We were hoping that by giving people the option to vote on different topics that we could be doing it in the spirit of the elections coming up. Um, for anybody who joined us after that, uh, we did just want to encourage everyone once again uh, to make sure that we're getting that vote out. Um, November 3rd is election day, uh, but also if you, you don't want to vote early, if you have mail-in ballots, you can submit those from today. Um, and we can go ahead and also uh, if you are subscribed to our newsletter, we put out a link um, that is now in the chat as well for you to be able to utilize. That'll give you resources to making your voting day plan. So, all right. So we're gonna hop right in with painting. Um, so Eddie, would you like to start or would you like me to? I could do a little bit of a quick kind of survey of what was going on at the whole house. So as you walk into the museum, if we were open at the moment, this would be the first painting that actually greets you. It's actually a very, I was, for me, I interpret this as a very pensive painting of um, Jane Addams. You can see that it's very softly lit, most of her body's in shadow. I think this is a really contemplative image. And I think it's a really good representation of Jane Addams as not as like the public face, but essentially like her as an individual and kind of her, I would say it's almost psychological in a sense that you can kind of get a, se a sense of her more intellectual side. And this is actually a really good painting that's created by one of our more, most popular painters at the museum, Alice Kellogg Tyler. So she also painted this. Also this, and this is really, really critical in the context of women's history and in art history. So Nadia, can you um, just um, tell us a little bit about Alice Kellogg Tyler? For sure. So Alice Kellogg Tyler was born in 1862. 
Um, she was a prolific painter and she actually was one of the very first women to start gaining a lot of notoriety um, in the Chicago area as well, as, or rather one of the first female painters um, to do so. And she also was uh, began to be well known in her later life as a uh, very influential when it came to impressionist painters um, in the city. So uh, Alice Kellogg Tyler herself studied in Paris um, under some very well-known painters. Um, and then upon returning to the States, she did, as you can see, a lot of the work that is actually still showcased at Hull House. Um, this painting of Mary Rose Smith, uh, she was a major benefactor to the Hull House Settlement House and she was Jane Addams' own partner, um, life partner. Um, and so uh, this painting actually hangs in Jane Addams' bedroom. Um, and then this painting is called The Mother um, and this one is also hanging in the museum and is really important because it was actually showcased at the 1893 World's Fair, the Columbian Exposition in Chicago. Um, it was one of two of her pieces that were actually part of an international juried um, exhibition that was in the Palace of Fine Arts. And the Palace of Fine Arts is actually the uh, Museum of Science and Industry here in Chicago today. Um, she also had showcased, I believe, another three or four paintings at the fair um, in different buildings, however. So um, Alice Kellogg Tyler actually passed away in 1900 at the age of 37 due to nephritis that she had struggled with her entire life. Um, but her work, as the years have gone on, has begun to, begun to um, get more notoriety and more attention um, because of the things that she was doing at the time. Um, if you look at this painting of the mother, you'll notice that it is quite a bit different from most portrayals you would see of um, mothers in, you know, in paintings of that period, but also um, it's been said to resemble the Madonna tro um, motif that is in paintings often. Um, and so what are, I'm just going to ask you guys to throw in the chat, what are some things you're noticing about this painting that maybe aren't as commonly seen from paintings that you might have seen from the 1800s and early 1900s. Also to note in our museum, this painting is in color, just- Yes. <laughs> Sadly, we were unable to find any high-res images of it um, in color. So. Any observations that you can make? Yeah, so for one thing, you'll notice that there's a lot of uh, clothing and fabric strewn about, right? The space isn't neat and exactly, it's messy. Um, and that makes it a lot more organic if you think about it. Um, you'll also notice that she's kind of sitting more at ease, um, not quite so posed as you would see in a lot of these paintings. Um, and so the reason for, rather the reason that's sometimes attributed to this is that uh, she may have been more prone to portraying these domestic um, concepts and ideas in a more organic, natural way um, than they were being presented by many of the male artists of the time. Mm -hmm. So there were also other painters who and artists who were very important at Hull House during this period. Um, one of them was Nora Hamilton, who was the sister of Alice Hamilton. Uh, she was a, Alice Hamilton was a well-renowned um, toxicologist who uh, had a lot of um, importance over time uh, in occupational safety um, and like reform um, in factory environments for toxic chemicals um, and industrial uh, illnesses. Nora, her sister was um, primarily working in etching um, and she did a lot of work that was both showcased um, in Alice's books, as well as in Jane Addams's um, autobiography and um, work about the beginning of Hull House called 20 Years at Hull House. Um, so she was quite prolific in her work as well. Yeah, there's also people like Sadie Ellis Garland Dreikers. So Sadie Ellis has a very interesting path. So what happened was um, she graduated art school actually came over to the whole house to work at the whole house as one of the residents. And she was really prolific in the art school. But then after leaving Hull house, she essentially became um, one of those foundational like health workers in Newfoundland. 
you can actually find a lot of her like research like kind of her health records on um, the work that she did in like the arctic which is like a really fascinating thing kind of jumped from essentially working at the hall house as an art teacher and then like hey i'm saving lives in the middle of like essentially the tundra which is really unfortunately there's not a whole lot written about her other than like the scant journal article if anyone there is a historian needing a topic to research, we highly suggest Sadie Ellis Garland Drykers. And then also, if you're curious, um, we mentioned earlier, especially in the pottery um, little discussion, who started the, um, what's it called? The whole house pottery like store was well, actually a couple. So there's Vino Matthias Seth Hanel and there's Hazel Johnson Hanel. So we actually had to look really deep into like history and then we actually found out about these names because um, art galleries in Chicago actually have some collections of their work. And in their biographies, they actually mentioned that they're the two that actually started the whole house store that like sold all the pottery. So that's actually, yeah, you can see like how deep but under-researched a lot of the smaller artists are. So we know a ton about Alice Kellogg Tyler, but we don't know too much about the other artists who worked with the Hull House Arts programs. And yeah, I think this is a really exciting time to be like researching these artists and seeing really their not one artistic impact, but also their social impact. So I don't know if there's any art history, history PhDs out there looking for a dissertation topic or just saying this is an option and we'd highly appreciate it. Yeah, I think just like for me, a final note that I've always been fascinated with Alice Kellogg Tyler is just like how she does portray her subjects. There, I think there's like certain like dignity, but also realism into how they're posed and painted. Like I'm thinking here, it's like a very like slightly hunched over, hands are very like, almost like, I wouldn't say awkward, but very naturalistically placed. It's definitely not posed. And also with this image, I would argue that this is not a very idealized image in a sense you can see like yeah like you would think that they would paint it very neat tidy orderly but I think this really falls in a lot with painters during that time when realism and kind of like portraying the realities of urban life especially during the progressive era when you can see this massive inequality I think this is a really interesting way of using art to talk about history and really its impact so that's always something I always like to bring up whenever I talk about these paintings. I agree yeah. that that nature of it be the, the subjects being more at ease um, is pretty unusual. Great. Does anybody have any uh, questions about any of this section or any thoughts they If anyone was really interested in learning about theater and the different programs about um, improv here at the whole house, you can definitely also check out our website. We do have some information about the history of improv. I think the two major figures you're gonna look up, if someone could type it up in the chat, is one Neva Boyd, who um, actually worked at the whole house and really was the progenitor of a lot of improvisational techniques, acting, and its impact in terms of like social, like an emotional learning. I would say that's a really good founding of that. And then one of her students, her name was Viola Spolin. And on um, Viola Spolin, she's considered one of the founders of the Second City um, Improv Troupe. So what happened was um, taking classes with Neva Boyd, a lot of Second City's kind of foundational philosophy of improv, along with Neva, um, Viola Spolin's son, Paul Sills, really, if you look at the history of improv in Chicago, they're going to pop up all the time. So I think if you look up those two names, Neva Boyd and Viola Spolin, those are going to be some really critical figures if you want to learn more about Whole House and improv here um, in Chicago. And we do have um, also in the chat um, a link um, to where you can find some more about this information as well. If you're really interested, um, feel free to leave in the chat as well. We may have future programming about it. So do not worry. We, um, we are always looking for feedback 
and looking for to make new programs that people are interested in. All right. Great. So Great. if we don't have any more questions from the chat or Facebook, I think it's time to get into the spicier part of this um, discussion. So um, Nadia and I are actually going to have a little bit of a discussion based on really conversations that have been happening, especially in the last couple months regarding the role of museums in a democratic society. Um, I'm, you know, if you haven't been on Facebook a while or follow a lot of different museums, Museums really have faced essentially a reckoning. Um, these are conversations that have been happening for years, if not decades. But really, in the past couple months, um, really, museums are um, having to reckon with what is the role of museum, especially, um, I think, about with Confederate monuments. Um, a big discussion is, should museums like have them in their collections? That's a big discussion that we have today. We're not going to get into that right now, but I think that is a good jumping off point into what roles do museums serve. So, um, Nadi, if you'd like to do a quick in like kind of breakdown of your positions, and I'll do mine. Sure. Um, so, there's a also um, alongside those shifts that are happening with museums in general. Um, you may have heard of the, this conversation that keeps popping up about decolonizing museums. Um, and so that is based on the understanding that the institution of museums as they are is based on um, the colonial infrastructures that are still uh, in place in the United States that our system is based on. Um, it, there was a need to um, create this idea of a space where groups that had been oppressed um, as time has gone on in the United States um, to be studied um, or coming into communities and changing up how those communities are being understood and perceived. Um, and also sort of creating a lack of accessibility to these institutions for people, depending on their background, depending on their, um, their uh, maybe sometimes socioeconomic status, sometimes their uh, spatial status, their regional status. Um, and so a lot of the conversation um, that is taking place in order to remove museums from that colonial structure to decolonize them is making them more accessible to the public in different ways. I mean, making them a little more, um, I suppose you could put it as like having to answer to the communities that they that surround them and the communities that um, they can and should be serving. Um, and so in line with that conversation is going to be some of the points that I hit, um, which is really about uh, just making um, museums a space where communities can gather um, and they can have access to the uh, learning and resources that exist within those spaces in a more aware, um, uh, a, a more culturally aware uh, perception. Um, so the first thing, uh, if you guys notice right here is, are museums primarily public spaces? Um, this question of what, uh, in what ways are museums uh, part of the communities in which they exist? Um, and so the, uh, this you know, message that is coming through with this is that a museum can become a gathering space, right? Um, there are many ways this can be done. Uh, for one thing, museums can create indoor community spaces. Um, this has often been done in terms of creating opportunities for programs um, that are being held for schools or for, um, you may have seen like library programs that are tied to uh, people having access to entry to the museums or maybe events that are tied to museums. Um, many museums have programs that they will uh, actually take to libraries around the city um, so that children in different areas will be able to, like summer programs, be able to have access to these um, events. Um, but also outdoor community spaces. Uh, many museums have large grounds, um, have large uh, sitting spaces in or around them. Um, the photo that you're looking at right now is actually from the Studio Museum in Harlem in New York City. Um, and they're actually, uh, it's, it's a cafe area, there's a lecture area as well. Um, and it's more open to the public 
um, as just sort of a gathering space where they can spend time if they like. Um, and they so they designed it as a reverse stoop. Um, and that's because there are the iconic brownstone stoops throughout Harlem. Um, and they felt that uh, in a, it would create more of a sense of connection to the community because that puts it in line with the um, kind of the design and infrastructure that the people living there are used to. Um, it is uh, a, the studio museum actually is a space for African-American artists work to be showcased um, in Harlem. Um, and so many museums are sort of creating this space, um, but uh, the hope is that it can also uh, create a means for uh, disadvantaged communities to be able to have greater access to these institutions, um, especially because it is often members of those communities whose cultures and whose historical backgrounds have been most affected by and often most harmed by these institutions. Um, so the second point, that we'll be talking about is um, how can we utilize museum collections um, and museums as these educational institutions as a means for decolonizing. Um, so you have, I'm sure if you've gone to any anthropological museum, um, any natural history, history museum, you have seen uh, exhibits showcasing indigenous artifacts. Um, one of the big conversations around those artifacts right now that is happening is how are we dealing with the fact that many of these artifacts have been stolen from their, um, from their communities um, or are being held um, with those communities attempting to repatriate, to take those artifacts back and having a hard time doing so. Um, and a lot of the social issues that are happening in our communities, in our cities right now are reflected in these collections. Um, and so the many museums are reforming um, or reimagining uh, how these exhibits look. Um, others are actually repatriating these artifacts and just getting rid of these uh, exhibits of these nature. Um, one of the really big pushes that's happening right now at the Field Museum here in Chicago um, is that they are completely redoing uh, their Native North American Hall, which has uh, been about the same since the 1950s. Um, just these huge cases of uh, indigenous artifacts from all over the country um, that are not necessarily like presented in any depth. They're almost just like in these boxes on display. Um, the photo you're looking at right now is actually from a land acknowledgement ceremony that happened at the Field Museum uh, around the time that the project began. Um, in order to acknowledge that Chicago as a whole, all of our cities, um, but particularly um, the Field Museum in this instance, uh, exist on what are heritage-based historical native lands, um, acknowledging which tribes lived in these spaces and who these uh, areas have been taken from. Um, and then there's also uh, pushes to incorporate cultural understandings and community-based understandings of topics that we're used to, like the sciences. There's all these conversations happening about how important it is um, to include indigenous voices in um, different environmental sciences and the climate change conversations um, because they know the land and they are able to manage it in ways that modern society doesn't really take into consideration. Um, and so museums are trying to create programs around that as well. And finally, um, our last point for this is, can we reimagine what a museum does? Um, and that is really driven by museum educators. Um, that is a facet of museums that is often underutilized. It's often not discussed um, or uh, taken into consideration in the way that it, they can actually impact a museum environment. Museums are often, you come into a space, you explore the space, um, you look at things, and then you go home. Um, but many more museums are beginning to have uh, a system of educators within exhibits um, that are not just having conversations about maybe one or two artifacts, but having programs based around these things, um, allowing people to come into these, these exhibits and really experience and get in depth about um, the topics that they're on, um, having access directly with artifacts that they can get hands-on with or they can exist in these historical spaces 
and have um, these educators create a sense of context um, so that people come in from different communities and they understand how this information relates to their lives. How does it affect them in their day to day? How is it important to them? Um, and also uh, creating some relevance for uh, topics that kind of get taken for granted. Um, and really it's important as well to have an informal learning space um, because students come from many different education-based systems, but they're mostly rote. Um, there isn't always this uh, encouragement for um, students to explore their understandings of things. And so when you have people in the community coming in and seeing these topics and the, uh, making them relevant to their own lives um, with the, the lack of pressure of structured learning, then that makes uh, for a major impact, a lasting impact on these students' lives and other guests' lives as well. Um, and so in regards to those, uh, those conversations, museums can very easily become an intrinsic part of a community. They can become a community space where people can come um, and really reimagine the way that they see themselves in the context of these institutions, as well as um, understanding how important it is uh, for them to be able to have access to this learning. Um, yeah, Joanne says that is such an important point. These educators can be transformative or if this is not well done, affirm dominant lies, exactly. And so that um, system of decolonization hopes to uh, start to extricate those lies, start to pull these cultural understandings out of the structure of these museums um, so that we can really change the way that we understand our world. So. Yeah. So I think it's a good time to move on to my, uh, <laughs> my points. I forgot to mention this earlier, but disclaimer, um, the, the opinions that are being said here are not museum official opinions, just, you know, for the sake of argument, hypothetical argument, forgot to mention that. <laughs> <No> <laughs> yeah, worries. these are conversations that are happening on large scales right now, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are definitely <laughs> taking conversations that have been happening, and we're just presenting that information out there. Just a quick disclaimer. <laughs> yeah. So I guess for me, my points are going to be focusing in on museum and collections and what their roles are in a democratic society and like what roles do collections play in that. So one of my first questions is, is what is a museum without a collection? So essentially, um, what I like to look at it is, I'm not going to play this video at the moment, but this is, it's going to play for me apparently. So this is, so this is actually, um, yeah, I don't think we're going to have time to play out the entire um, video clip, but essentially this is a video from the American Museum of Natural History, and it details um, object conservation, specifically Inuit objects um, that are in the museum's collection. As Nadia mentioned that um, a lot of these objects were unfortunately stolen or taken through unethical means. Um, yeah, like this is just like um, whether or not these are repatriated, whether or not commu like, you know, communities want these objects or if these um, objects are even like, it's very complicated. Essentially, um, there's a very wide variety of options. How the um, Museum of Natural History deals with it is actually bringing in um, community members from these indigenous communities and actually inviting them to like take care of these objects and really like contextualize them and like really provide them um, context that these objects need. So in this particular instance, they bring in um, essentially a community elder and the object conservator has no idea what any of these objects are. They don't know like how to repair them because a lot of times these objects are so old that they're beginning to deteriorate. deteriorate. So um, without that knowledge, they have no hope of understanding how to fix them. So by bringing in this indigenous knowledge, they're able, they're able to one, you know, take care of these objects for perpetuity, not to mention that they have that much more information by having this um, community elder actually come in and talk about how the object's used, how the object is made. And this is knowledge that unfortunately, um, a, you know, years ago would have been attempted to be destroyed. So um, whether or not, you know, these collections are unethically created, 
unfortunately, sometimes this is one of the few places that this knowledge is actually being held. So um, really the conversation is who gets to have this knowledge, who gets to have these objects and really like where are our priorities in terms of knowledge and indigenous rights. Um, you know, I'm only saying this for the sake of argument, but this is just a question that is, you know, being had at the moment. Another um, part that I like to talk about is actually the way that museums collect and preserve. So um, you may have heard that all uh, museums are actually collecting those pink pussy hats from the Women's March. People are collecting um, protest signs, especially with all the protests that have been happening in the last couple of years. Um, this is something that's, you know, something that the museums do is that they document, is that they collect, is that they have essentially a duty to like um, collect information on what's going on happening in our contemporary time and then be able to preserve that for history in order to contextualize what's going on. So there's actually a lot of really interesting projects that are happening across different museums. Probably one of my more, um, favorite ones is actually with the National African American History Museum through the Smithsonian. And they actually have what's called the Great Migration Home Videos Project. So they're actually asking a lot of um, Black residents who actually moved in from the South during the Great Migration and really along with their descendants is they're offering free digitization services for any kind of medium that they have, like whether it be like film, old cassettes, or like those like really slightly combustible like nitrate films. These are actually being digitized, one for the family's like future, you know, use and enjoyment, but also creating that archive of what it was looking like, like living there. Because really, I don't know if anyone knows this, but film is very, very fragile. If you're using film that's like, if you're pushing 50, it's basically going to crumble in your hands. Some of the nitrate-based films like that are like early 1900s, they are known to spontaneously combust. And this is sometimes really some of the only records that we have of Black life in the early 1900s. So by really engaging that community, they're able to have this really interesting project of one, preserving these, um, these memories for not just these families, but then also um, really for anyone who would like to see these images and really create an understanding of what it's like to live during that time. So I think it's one, a community engagement project and also a really great historical project as well. I think this is another more sad story is that um, some of you may have seen this uh, NPR article of the Smithsonian actually trying to collect um, children's drawings who are actually currently being detained in um, detainment camps. So what happened was this is actually a fairly controversial measure in the sense that some people kind of see this as exploiting these children and you know for collecting these in, um, in museums. But on the flip side, you could make the argument that these records would be destroyed. And unfortunately, um, from what we know now, a lot of um, immigrant testimony that's being silenced left and right. Um, these images that are being taken out of the detainment facilities might be some of the only records that we can have that kind of detail what it's like living there inside a detainment camp. I think it's extremely important that one, we have this documentation. So really it's more testimony of the injustice and really human rights abuses that people are facing on a daily basis. I think um, this is just, it's unfortunate that we have to like still be collecting this information, but at the same time, unfortunately, it's critical that we have a documentation and that we are able to actually preserve these in order to hopefully not have it happen again. But as you know, in our times, this is really the only thing, one of the few things we can do, at least from a museum standpoint of being able to document these abuses and really show objectively what was happening during that time. And finally, I also like to talk about really objects themselves and really how they could be used for a current good. So these are actually um, an image from the Field Museum itself. And this is actually looking at um, the same bird species, but at two different times. So the birds on the right 
you're going to see are pretty, you know, brightly colored. You can see like, you know, distinct coloration. And these were taken right before the um, second industrial revolution. We talk a lot about this in our whole house programming. And this is really the birds are, you know, normal color. But on the left, you're going to see that they're dark. That's because they're covered in soot. This is because the, this is um, the impact of pollution um, uh, from the great, um, really big rush in industrialization. So we can clearly see that there's a clear difference in the quality of life just by evidence of these birds. And really, we wouldn't have this information if the Field Museum wasn't collecting this information and collecting not only historical artifacts, but also natural history specimens. So this was really interesting because this is some of the few objective proofs on how really impactful pollution, industrialization, and also you can make the claim climate change has been impacting our society for the last 150 years. Um, so I like to always bring this up as the way of collections, not only as a historical artifact, but also a record of changing times. You can see how, like, you know, from museum collections that the world is constantly changing. And also from this image, a lot of it's human change. So I think it's important that really you have kind of have to politicize these collections, not only for the really the great harm that museums have done, especially with indigenous communities, but also their potential in really being essentially a witness to change across time and history. So I think um, as times go on, collections like these are only going to become more exponentially important as time goes on. So obviously Nadia's and I positions are not binary, they're not mutually exclusive. I think this is a really good jumping off point for a lot of more conversations on what um, purpose a museum serves, not to mention what a museum can do in the future and what a museum of the future can actually look like. Now that, do we have any um, questions, conversations from any of the chats so far? We have a couple of really great um, comments in the chat. Uh, Jennifer shared an article that is uh, about a recent situation around theater artists as activists. Um, she writes, finding an artistic way to bring attention to the issue of acquisitions. Um, I did take a glance at it. It looks really, really fascinating um, having to do with a, a commentary and criticism of um, the way that museums have acquired um, artifacts from different parts of the world, uh, especially parts that are um, that are uh, that suffered from imperialist um, actions of the past. So definitely check that article out, guys. Um, and then Joanne says, context is everything. Lack of context is why we have such upheaval over monuments. Most people don't understand the role of Jim Crow era monuments in repression because they have been taught that they are representative of objective history, objective in quotes. Those children's drawings are critical records to preserve like Holocaust era diaries. Exactly, these are um, means of telling people stories from their own experiences um, in ways that sort of uh, are minimized um, whenever looking at just the artifact itself. And so, uh, as Eddie was saying, these institutions can be um, a space for change and a space for examination of change um, over time. And having these artifacts is important for that. Fantastic. Any other thoughts or questions? Anything, anything from Facebook, Stefan? I believe Ross is in charge of Facebook. I was briefly on there for a moment. Oh, gotcha. Sorry. Anything from Facebook, Ross? No, nothing on Facebook. All right. I just reshared that article. Um, so let me know if that shows up in the chat now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it is currently 102. So we went just slightly over. But I think this is a good um, jumping off point for like, you know, really thinking about really um, what not only in museums and how they play a role in democracy, but also really just thinking about how your impact, and especially during these really tum um, tumultuous times, I think this is a really good, you know, jumping off point to thinking about what we can do to change 
and what changes that we can make in our own lives, in a sense, not just in museums, but in our own lives. Yeah, so yeah, we wanna thank you so much for taking the, your time to kind of walk through our chat a little bit about our little mini debate. And yeah, so if there's anything that you'd like to add, feel free to add it to our social medias. We love your feedback. I think this is, again, if you have anything that you want us to do, we'll definitely take a look at it. And other than that, thank you guys so much for coming down um, and visiting us during this time. Thank you for taking your Sundays out for us. Thank you guys. And don't forget those upcoming events. You can actually see them on our uh, website um, that have details. You can RSV per, RSVP for them. They are free events um, that show that really tackle a lot of very relevant issues at the moment, including race um, and including um, uh, you know women's rights, especially in light of uh, this being the hundredth anniversary of women uh, securing the vote. So. Um, check that out. Also, just as a quick plug, if you haven't gotten a chance to visit our museum um, and would like to do so, even though we're closed for the pandemic, we do have a virtual version of our tour on our website as well. Um, it's 360 uh, imagery taken of every single room throughout it, so you can take a virtual tour um, and check it all out in uh, an up-close way. So, Thank you so much for coming, everyone. Take care. Have a great rest of your Sunday. Stefan has just included a link to the virtual tour if you guys want to see that.